So this will be the second video on the series on electron transport chain. In the first video, we discuss the overview and the various complexes of the electron transport chain. Make sure to watch that video before watching the second video on this topic. Also make sure to watch the videos on Krebs cycle, glycolysis as well as beta oxidation before watching this video. So let's try to understand how the electron transport chain actually works. Here is an illustration which depicts the membrane structure of the mitochondria as well as the organization of the various electron chain complexes. When we compare it to the structure of the mitochondria, we can see that here is the outer mitochondrial membrane. On the inside, we have the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is represented by the space between the bottom two lines of the illustration. The space between them is the intermembrane space, and the space inside the mitochondria is the matrix of the mitochondria. In the matrix of the mitochondria, we have the various biochemical cycles like the Krebs cycle as well as the beta oxidation of fatty acids. These biochemical cycles generate reducing equivalents called the NADH and the FADH2. The electron transport begins when the NADH donates its electrons to the first complex. In the first complex, the electrons are first received by the flavine mononucleotide prosthetic group. The FMN then donates the electrons to the iron sulfur proteins. These are redox reactions, in which the iron ions go from the ferrous state to the ferric state depending upon when they receive and when they donate the electrons. In the next step, the iron sulfur proteins donate the electrons to coenzyme Q. Q is the ubiquinol which is a freely permeable molecule inside the inner mitochondrial membrane. These redox reactions generate energy which is used to pump four hydrogen ions from the matrix of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space. The coenzyme Q then combines with two hydrogen ions from the matrix of the mitochondria and gets converted to the reduced form of ubiquinol. Now coming to the second complex which is the succinate dehydrogenase complex. This complex contains the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase. The succinate dehydrogenase catalyzes the conversion of succinate to fumarate in the Krebs cycle. This is an oxidation reaction which causes the generation of FADH2. The FADH2 stay inside the second complex and donate the electrons to the iron sulfur complexes of the complex 2. The electrons are then transferred to the ubiquinol in a similar way as the electrons are transferred from the first complex. The ubiquinol is a freely permeable molecule inside the inner mitochondrial membrane which is used to transfer electrons to the third complex. In the third complex, the electrons are first received by the cytochrome C1. The cytochrome C1 then transfers the electrons to iron sulfur proteins which then donate the electrons to cytochrome B. These are all redox reactions. The electrons are then transferred to the cytochrome C which is an intermediate protein used to donate electrons to the fourth complex. The redox reactions inside the third complex cause the pumping of four hydrogen ions to the intermembrane space. In the next step, the cytochrome C1 donates the electron to the fourth complex. In the fourth complex, the electrons are first received by the copper ions which are of A type. The copper ions then donate the electron to the cytochrome A. The cytochrome A then transfers the electron to copper ions which are of B type. These copper ions then transfer the electrons to cytochrome A3. The cytochrome A3 in the final step donates the electrons to the final electron acceptor which is the oxygen. The oxygen combines with two hydrogen ions from the matrix of the mitochondria and gets reduced to water. These redox reactions in the fourth complex cause the pumping of two hydrogen ions to the intermembrane space. 
All this pumping of hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space causes the generation of higher concentration of hydrogen ions into the inner membrane space as compared to the low concentration inside the matrix of the mitochondria. Inner mitochondrial membrane is an impermeable membrane to ions so hydrogen ions cannot cross the membrane as such. Here comes the role of another enzyme called the ATP synthase. The ATP synthase is present inside the inner mitochondrial membrane and it uses the flow of hydrogen ions from higher concentration to the lower concentration to generate energy. This energy is used to phosphorylate adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate. This is the basis of generation of energy inside the body. The working of ATP synthase can be compared to the working of a hydroelectric power project. The water that is collected behind the dam can be compared to the hydrogen ions in a higher concentration in the intermembrane space. The turbines of the dam can be compared to the enzyme ATP synthase. When the water flows from a height which is compared to the flow of hydrogen ions from a higher gradient to the lower gradient, this causes the spinning of turbines inside the dam which can be compared to the functioning of ATP synthase. The power is generated inside the dam which can be compared to the adenosine triphosphates generated through the ATP synthase. So this was the mechanism of working of the electron transport chain. Now let's talk about the various energy calculations for per molecule of glucose that passes through the biochemical cycles of glycolysis, Krebs cycle as well as the electron transport chain. In glycolysis when glucose is converted to pyruvate we get a net of 2 ATPs and 2 NADH. In the next step when pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, we again get 2 NADH. In the Krebs cycle, when glucose passes through one cycle of Krebs cycle, it gives 2 GTPs which are energy equivalent to 2 ATPs. We also get 6 NADH and 2 FADH2. All these reducing equivalents are then metabolized in the electron transport chain. In the electron transport chain, we metabolize the 2 NADH from glucose to pyruvate conversion. Also the 2 NADH we get from the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and the 6 NADH and the 2 FADH2 we get from the Krebs cycle. In the electron transport chain, for every 4 hydrogen ions that flow through the ATP synthase, one molecule of ATP is generated. So when 4 hydrogen ions pass through ATP synthase, it is utilized for the phosphorylation of one molecule of adenosine diphosphate. Now one molecule of NADH which donates its electron to the electron transport chain causes the movement of 10 hydrogen ions from the matrix to the intermembrane space. These hydrogen ions when flow back through the ATP synthase give rise to 2.5 ATPs. In a similar way, one FADH2 causes the movement of 6 hydrogen ions to the intermembrane space which when moved back give rise to 1.5 ATPs. Using these values, we can calculate that 2 NADH from the conversion of glucose to pyruvate will give 5 ATPs. Similarly, conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA will give 5 ATPs in the electron transport chain. 6 NADH we get through the Krebs cycle will give rise to 15 ATPs and the 2 FADH2 of the Krebs cycle give rise to 3 ATPs. In a total, we get 20 ATPs from the Krebs cycle. We get 7 ATPs from the conversion of glucose to pyruvate in glycolysis and we get 5 ATPs from the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. In a total, we have 32 ATPs per molecule of glucose which passes through all these biochemical cycles. So this was all about the electron transport chain and the energy production. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found this video helpful. For all the new visitors, make sure to hit the subscribe button. For all the